Off top, sloths can sleep while hanging from trees because their hands work opposite as humans. They have to exert energy to open their fists. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. All right, welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. A very special episode. We are joined by an in-person guest, one of my favorite people to read and listen to, Derek Thompson of the Plain English Podcast, staff writer at The Atlantic, writer of two books with another on the way, I do believe, right? That is right. He also talks about the most and writes about the most important, significant things in our society all the time, thinks about him, one of the best thinkers I know. But that's not what we're doing here today. We're here what are to we doing about, here today? Yeah, we're here to talk about sports oh, good. and fun okay. stuff, stuff that doesn't matter. But welcome, and we appreciate you joining. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Oh, yeah. It's all true. Uh, as we just talked about, I wouldn't lie to you. That's right. I like to keep it real with people. That's how they know that I really care about them. All right. So before we get into, I sent you an email with a ton of really interesting to me, big picture topics. We'll get to those. But first, we got to establish your sports bona fides. All right. Let's do it. Favorite athlete of all time? Well, look, I got into baseball in the mid-1990s, okay. and my favorite team, because my uncle lived in New York, was the New York Yankees, and there was this rookie who shared my first name, oh, Derek gosh. Jeter. <laughs> so I would say that I probably cared more for Derek Jeter in the late 1990s, early 2000s, than I've ever cared about any other athlete. But most recently, I would say Peyton Manning is probably my favorite athlete. That's recent. Yeah. Peyton Manning? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, I'm still holding on to the, the old days I here. feel like you age out of having like an all-time favorite athlete, so it that's has fair. to be from an era when, no, that's you're, a fair when point. you're younger. That's a fair point. You're younger. You cared a lot more about it. So Peyton Manning is an interesting choice because while I don't think the stats will sh tell you this or history will tell you this, I believe he's the best quarterback of all time. Like I know he's not the greatest quarterback of all time, like seven Super Bowls, and Tom Brady is apparently coming back for the 49ers. But I personally, <laughs> having played against both of them and having watched a lot of football, and Charlie and I have had this discussion before, yeah. that um, Peyton Manning was kind of the turning point for what a modern quarterback is, his ability to understand the defense and make decisions at the line. And still, like he wasn't have a great strong arm, or he was very accurate, but all that together, I think, Peyton at his peak, and I know playoff woes and all that, at his peak, nobody was better than No one had more command. So I, I was upset about Derek Jeter because that's like a real kind of... I know. It's, it's not a cool answer. Look, yeah. neither Peyton Manning nor Derek Jeter are very cool answers here when it comes to favorite <laughs> athlete. Can I ask you a question, though, about Peyton Manning? Okay, so obviously, I've had this debate with my friends. My best friend is a Tom Brady fan. I was a Peyton Manning fan. I now say, look, Tom Brady's the GOAT. I'm no yeah. longer going to argue it. Give me ammunition. The next time that I decide for whatever reason to have a Tom Brady versus Peyton Manning, and let's be fair, also versus Patrick Mahomes right. debate, what is the best piece of evidence that I can use to say, look, my friend Dominique told me he's played against the two arguable goats That's in the 19, early That's 2000s. The best, that, did, did, your, did your friend play? <laughs> he did not play. Okay, there you go. That's it. But when he says, what did Dominique, what did he find out? What did you see on the field that we can't see when we're looking on the couch? What what makes him the best? So I, I would say that the, the surrounding cast, and I think this actually is going to dovetail well into one of the topics that I think is hugely important, is because I think the difference is everything around everyone else. And Patrick Mahomes, everything around him has been pretty damn great mm -hmm. and everything around Tom Brady when he's had success has been pretty damn great Peyton Manning we dropped him into a pretty bad organization with ownership that had some tough questions with a history of an organization that hasn't been successful without a ton of talent he struggled a little bit at first but he developed the offense to a way along with the coaching staff and along with the players that they brought in he developed the offense to a degree that allowed everyone else to then copy and mimic and build on that. And I think everyone, even, and like you, like this is a debate I stopped trying to have because he won seven Super Bowls. Like, yeah. all right, you guys win. And broke every record. Yeah. And broke every record. Yeah. You guys win. Tom yeah. Brady's the greatest of all time. But if you're talking like peak one moment at a time, anybody at their best, if I could like win one game, I think it's Peyton Manning. And part of it might also be that, other players built on it and improved mm -hmm. 
but he was like the the forefather in the same way that you could say like Bill Russell's the greatest shot blocker of all time when yeah he's not <laughs> like he's because, blocking guys yeah. like me and Derek <laughs> <laughs> he was, was he, six eight six nine yeah and uh, so I think some of that is is part of the like not nostalgia, but like appreciation for how difficult it is to be an originator. Mm -hmm. But I do think the best argument is when you break down what uh, Tom Brady, because obviously he's the one who we look at, break down what his career was and you go through all of his seasons and you go through all the success that he had. A lot of it can be attributed to the things that were around him. Mm -hmm. And not to take away from him, he still did that thing to the Falcons. Mm -hmm. That's true. And even though you added Randy Moss to the roster, he still threw those passes. And and so it's hard whenever you have these arguments or these conversations because it feels like you're, like, talking to the other guy. Like, no, he's great, too. But if you're looking for um, level of difficulty, mm -hmm. I think that, Peyton Manning. And that that's the argument. So clip that and send that to that jerk. Great. I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to do it. And this is going to get into, I think, what we're going to talk about. Because what you're essentially saying is, even though it's very, very difficult to evaluate quarterbacks independently, mm. because the quarterback is an interdependent position, if we try to evaluate them independently, Peyton Manning maybe is the greater quarterback mind, the greater quarterback talent mm -hmm. than Tom Brady was independently. Tom Br Brady depended on the Tampa Bay's and a great team. He depended on the genius of Belichick yeah. um, and that organization for a long time. But maybe if we try to see, and this is a very hard thing to do, right. try to see the independent talent within mm -hmm. the interdependent network. He's it's, the best. It's, all right, we're going to stop teasing what we get into. I'll let Charlie set it up in a second. But I think it's not that hard to do, honestly. I mean, I think it's very difficult to do, but in this situation is you can look at what was happening for those teams. Like, we know Tom Brady's first Super Bowl, the game-winning drive was good, but we know how they got there, and we know how that game developed, and we know, like, how he ended up there, and we know how the subsequent seasons went, and we saw him mature, mature into the superstar all-time great quarterback. But he wasn't that at first. Mm -hmm. And Peyton Manning had a slightly different yeah. path. All right, Charlie. No, grab, I mean, I, grab I, hold of the wheel. You can you can Peyton versus Brady as much as I want. One of my <laughs> one of my hobby horses is he revolutionized his position and a lot of Brady's stats are because he started playing a way that Peyton did. <laughs> Go to the line, see the defense, eviscerate it. How? <gasps> Yeah, I, I, I having played against um, Peyton, this is the thing that stood out to me, and this is partially part of the biases I played against them. At Peyton was at his peak, and Tom was a member of the system, and we were able to beat Tom a couple times. Mm -hmm. Never beat Peyton. Even when I played in Baltimore, we held them to, I think, 13 points. They still won. But the thing that was infuriating, and it might also be just what you value and what you find more impressive, but what was infuriating about – Peyton Manning was he had this ability to know what you were in mm -hmm. and he would study the film to a point where if one defensive tackle was one step out of place he would understand that that meant that this linebacker's responsibility was this which means that this safety's responsibility is this which mm -hmm. means that despite the fact that this corner is in a squat technique I know he's in cover three mm -hmm. and I'm like oh I got you now Peyton I'm gonna mm -hmm. trap you into this pass no it didn't work. And when we had success with him, it was because we would say, all right, Peyton's going to see this and know that that means this because it means that. It means this. Mm -hmm. So we know that he thinks this, and then we'll get an interception. I think um, a lot of people like to bring up where uh, – Bill Belichick called Ed Reed the greatest safety ever because of play that he made, and I was on the field that play. And I remember clearly that that's what happened. They ran a comeback to uh, Reggie Wayne, and they hurried it up. And we, when that normally happens, we check four because we don't have a chance. We go to our base teams, we check four. So we looked at each other and said, all right, Peyton knows that he got us in the defense he wants. Hurry up, check four. He thinks we're checking four. They put a formation that we would check two in. So we start pretending we're checking two. I squat on the comeback. Ed gets the interception. And I'm like, that took <laughs> like an insane amount of coordination to make this happen. And that's also where I'm like, never happened before. Like, I, mm. I haven't had that. And maybe Tom Brady's advanced to that level. But uh, I just didn't see it. Yeah. All right. Okay. We'll do it. So this is a good point to pivot because we're going to talk about or lead with the quarterbacks in this upcoming NFL draft. Caleb Williams, some people think the best prospect since Peyton Manning or better since John Elway or since Andrew Luck. However you want to view it, he's 
seen as a slam dunk prospect. There's also Drake May. There's also Jaden Daniels. Friend of the program, Nate Tice, evaluates all three of those guys that they could be at the top of any draft class. Hmm. There's a good chance that one, two, maybe even all three of those quarterbacks could suck. <laughs> we don't know <laughs> if it's because of the way we evaluate quarterbacks, if it's because of the situation they're being put into, if it's because of an innate talent that we don't get to see at the college level that's just not there. But the question I want to ask for you guys is, why do you think it is so hard to scout quarterbacks and draft quarterbacks and develop quarterbacks? And what are we doing wrong? How are we looking at this that's incorrect? Yeah, I, I could start. It's not a new theory for you, but and yeah. people who are like listeners might have heard me point this out before is I believe that it's not about the quarterback. It's about the situation. And if you look at all the best quarterbacks in football now, it's not a coincidence that they all came into good situations. If you look at all the best quarterbacks through since Cam Newton, which is when the the draft compensation changed, if you look at that, and you could probably go back further than that to even like all time great quarterbacks, all the quarterbacks that we think of as great, like they have come into really good situations. And my theory is. Any quarterback that's drafted in the first round, and honestly, almost any quarterback that's drafted into the NFL, they have the talent to have success. But the reason why they don't have success is because there are so many different variables in the game that they can't control for. And I think more than anything, the quarterbacks need time and experience. And in order to have the time and experience to add new things to their game, and this is the Tom Brady is the perfect example of this. Tom Brady wasn't special that's why he was drafted as late as he was and that's why we see that milk body uh (laughs) combine picture all the time like and tom brady i think would even suggest that he was not like a special standout prospect we all saw but he was in a situation he was smart enough and he was in a situation where they didn't ask a lot of him early on and they supported him and he was able to develop and add more and more things to his game I can go down the list of all the quarterbacks Dak Prescott fits that perfectly Russell Wilson though he's not good right now he was the same thing in that situation I would even say Patrick Mahomes even though he came in great that team oh that's the best situation 13 and Mm 3 before he showed up Lamar Jackson Josh Allen came on to a playoff team like these are all guys and Josh Allen struggled more and then Diggs showed up he got better But this is not, I think, Joe Burrow and, I guess, last year is the only time where we've seen guys drop to C.J. Stroud, dropped into situations that we all believed were bad, and then them showing up the next year the team is good. I think those are great points. I have a couple points that I want to make. First, I am just so interested in the question of potential. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so interesting how interested we all are in the question of potential. Like a possible trade is always more interesting than the team that already exists. The next greatest quarterback is more interesting than the current greatest quarterback. Whoever's going, like figuring out who's going to be the next LeBron James, the next Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan, the next Patrick Mahomes is more interesting than the fact of LeBron James, the fact of Patrick Mahomes. So I, I always find conversations about potential to be inherently interesting. And I think that because they're inherently interesting, we probably don't understand potential nearly as well as we pretend to understand potential. And I would say this is definitely true of NFL draft rooms. Like since, as you said, the rookie salary schedule reset, teams reasonably now see that first round quarterbacks are a relative steal. It's an incredibly important position and you don't have to pay them as much as you used to have to pay them. And now you have a bunch of quarterbacks that come off the map immediately first pick second pick third pick is probably what's going to happen this year with caleb daniels and may who knows maybe jj mccarthy is going to be the fourth fourth pick pick. it it could be four in a row which i'm not sure that's ever happened before but also this interest and this 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 game we play on ourselves that we can predict the future exists in tension with the fact that quarterbacking is so interesting because it is simultaneously the most important position in sports so they say and the most interdependent Mm -hmm. position in sports quarterbacks do not call their own plays unless you're peyton manning unless you're a couple other players, I suppose. They mostly don't call their own plays. They certainly don't block for themselves. They don't catch their own passes. And unless you're Lamar Jackson and you're responsible for essentially, you know, 70% of your team's like running game, you're probably not responsible for the entirety of the play in which you're calling yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's an incredibly interdependent position. And what makes it so hard, I think, is that you are essentially taking an interdependent part 
from a college team and then saying, okay, we're going to take away your college offensive line. We're going to take away your college coach. We're going to take away your college wide receivers. We're going to take away the entire context that may have explained your success. And then we're going to drop you in an entirely different context and see how you behave in that. You know, it's a little bit like, like a plant that like grows beautifully in Malaysia. And you're like, let's see how this does in Oklahoma. Like who the hell knows? It's and the other, the other factor that's changing that, that I'm sure we'll get to is like, Take away the college defenses. Yep. Yes. Yeah, and that matters. But I think the this like I think bolsters the point that I'm trying to make is that football is an incredibly complex game, and I think our response, and I know that this is going to sound silly, but I think our response to the rookie wage scale changing was the wrong one. Hmm. The response that we've gotten is we should draft more quarterbacks because they're the most important position mm. and they're cheap. And we've seen teams have a lot of success when they have a young, cheap quarterback. But I don't think that's the lesson. I think the lesson is we should not necessarily depend so much on trying to nail this quarterback because I think that if the roster is fine or if you get the roster right, you get the coaches right, you get the situation right, then the quarterback comes in and turns into the quarterback that you want. That's what we've seen happen more than anything else. That's what we saw with Aaron Rodgers. That's what we're seeing again with Jordan Love. That's what we've seen happen. Brock Purdy. Though, yeah, that's I was going to say, yeah, imagine a team that had – all-stars up and down the defense, some of the most extraordinary weapons at wide receiver yeah. in the NFL, mm -hmm. the best running back, some of the most talented offensive linemen, you could throw almost anybody back there. <laughs> almost say anyone. The right, almost anyone yeah. except for the third pick in that draft. Yeah. Um, but I, I, it's, it's interesting because I remember having this conversation um, with Danny Heifetz, uh, the host of the, uh, the Ringer NF, uh, Fantasy Podcast. Oh, yeah. Love that. Shout out. You know, what if... Right now, we're trying to explain away Brock Purdy. Mm. We're trying to excuse his record. And look, maybe he's brilliant. Maybe he's not. We're, we're not going to resolve that question in the next 15 minutes. But what I asked him was, what if we saw what the 49ers were doing as the future? Yeah. Is that a model you could use? And tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong, sure. Dominique. It sounds like what you're saying is, what if, you, if, if a team truly embraced the 49ers model? they wouldn't spend their first round, second round, third round pick necessarily on the quarterback. What they would think is, we need a guy who's smart enough to understand our offense. And if we put him in a brilliant, perfect offense surrounded by expensive uh, weapons, then we'll have a team that can make it to the Super Bowl. What's hard about that, and I'm really interested to, to, mm -hmm. to hear if you guys think the sort of the Brock Purdy model is replicable across the NFL. What seems difficult is eventually... Your guy's under center in the Super Bowl, if you're lucky. And he has to do something. He can't be ordinary yeah. if he's going up against Patrick Mahomes. He right. has to be extraordinary. And so maybe it's it's tough if you're going to purposefully underinvest in what is still a really important position. So how does the Brock Purdy model scale? So one of the things I think is fascinating about this question, it's something I brought up to Dominique before we did the show. If you were to just take the names and their college careers off of them, physically, the tools that they have, and the amount of starts they had in college, there's not actually that much separating someone like Brock Purdy from someone like Bryce Young, who was the first pick versus the last pick in the draft. And the quarterback position, I think, is the only position in sports that's like that. You can't imagine a shooting guard having roughly the same physical skill set that's picked first overall when he's like the marquee guy you know he's going to be an NBA All-Star with someone who goes undrafted or is the 199th prospect in the draft. And to me, that makes it the mo uh, like something that's really interesting about building through a quarterback later is... Are we looking for the right tools? Hmm. Are those things that we can find later in drafts that fit systems? Yeah. So I think I think you're exactly right almost. Okay. And I think <laughs> the 49ers don't even believe the 49ers model as evidenced by them trading away all the draft picks to move up to get it's trade a great lines. Point. And yeah. I think that that doesn't mean they're right. I think that the only thing that I would tweak about what you're saying is – I wouldn't necessarily look for a quarterback that fits my system. I think what is more important is a smart, flexible coach, a lot of smart, flexible, talented players around them. And then you go get the best quarterback you can find given that situation, given the situation you're in. And then the scheme that you present adapts to what the quarterback you get does. Like, and I, I, if I feel like 
when there's something so obvious after you realize it, you feel dumb. Like that's how this feels to me when we're talking about this, because we have seen this work and the 49ers are a place where we've seen it work. And maybe that uh, with RG three here, Kyle Shanahan ran a different system. You find a system that works for your guy. And it seems that the other strategy is gambling. Like the other strategy is we're going to keep drafting somebody until we find Patrick Mahomes, when in actuality, we have Patrick Mahomes in part because he landed with Andy Reid, Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, mm. and like in that situation. So I think that the smarter way to go about this is not what David Tepper did last year, where it's like, you know what, we got an OK team. Let's go get the best quarterback out there. I think that no matter who that quarterback is, like we can go to a bunch of average to slightly above average quarterbacks. I think Jared Goff, perfect example. Super toolsy quarterback. Awful. Got a good coach in. Good enough. Can't win a Super Bowl. Send him away. Mediocre. Surrounded with talent. Pretty damn good. <laughs> Tua. Awful. Get him a good coach. Some great receivers. All right. Pretty damn good. Like, I don't know how many times we have to well, see this. This isn't this work pretty... out until someone looks up and says, you're not going to like the Giants are a team that's considering drafting quarterback mm -hmm. so that they can go ahead and ruin this quarterback like they did Daniel Jones. Can Stop I, it. Can I ask two questions? I, yes. I, I love this line of thinking. Okay. Question number one. Jalen Hurts. Another example. Am I right Sorry. in summarizing your view as there are a handful of true quarterbacking geniuses. Peyton Manning's exist in the world, but the vast majority of quarterbacks exist in this sort of big mm -hmm. hump of normality yeah. in the middle. There's just a bunch of like B minus C plus quarterbacks that exist and whose success is exquisitely sensitive to their surrounding talent. And we should draft quarterbacks with that understanding. Is, is, is that your, your thesis here? Absolutely. Okay, understanding that thesis, how does that change drafting strategy? Yeah. You're the Bears. Yes. You're the Commanders. Caleb the, is on the, the board. Drake May is on the board. Are you saying, screw that, I'm going for Marvin, Marvin Harrison Jr., I'm getting uh, you know, a left tackle. No. Where does that, how does it change no. drafting strategy to basically assume the vast majority of quarterbacks are interchangeable parts? The Bears did it right. The Bears are ready for a quarterback. Yeah. The Bears have receivers mm -hmm. and extra draft picks and tackles and a defense that was getting better. Like what Ryan Pace has done there is the opposite of what the Bears have done for their entire quarterback trash history. Mm -hmm. So like that is doing it right. The The trade was a... Uh, fortunate that they ended up with the number one pick but I would have guessed that if they ended up with a top five top 10 15 mm -hmm. pick whoever they got would have been okay or a free agent quarterback they would have brought in would have done well in that situation my point is just because you're there don't draft the guy unless he happens unless you believe that he is a Peyton Manning. Yeah. Otherwise, don't trade back or get Marvin Harrison. Build a roster that is ready for a quarterback. Find coaches that are flexible and smart. I think that there are many different paths to success. And I think it's absurd that we are ignoring the one that I think is most consistently replicable because we've convinced ourselves that something else is happening that's not happening. We've convinced ourselves that the teams who do draft successful quarterbacks have found these special, special quarterbacks. I don't think so. I think the teams that have had success have found quarterbacks that are good, but have come into really great situations. It's tough because Patrick Mahomes won the last two Super Bowls. Of course he is. In a great situation. But I, I think, yeah. I think Patrick Mahomes does not break the rule. The quarterbacks yeah, the that yeah. break the rule well, is CJ Stroud breaks the rule. I think Joe Burrow, when he's healthy, breaks the rule. I think Peyton Manning breaks the rule. I think nobody else really breaks the rule. So there's some interesting stuff here. One, I think these this rule was sort of made in the 80s, and there's articles and data that, sub, that supports that like scouting quarterbacks was almost easier then the guys who were taken at the top of the draft generally were more successful and in the last decade that's become less and less true and there are probably a number of re reasons for that innovation trickles up and from college football to the nfl the offenses are so far ahead of the defenses where you know this from experience the defenses are much more complex in the nfl so yeah. guys are playing a different sport um 
And the quarterback position has changed more. The way they throw the ball more and more and more, it's become an even more precise position. But what I'm wondering is, I looked at some of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, and I look at them, one of the through lines, actually Joe Burrow, he's sort of in this, but he's can be removed. You look at Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, um, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert. These guys are all incredibly toolsy quarterbacks, and that's almost what I think you should be looking at for this. You don't want to hit the double. Yeah, you can hit the double with the draft pick, you, but if you're drafting at the top of the draft, you have to try and find the home run. That's one of the mistakes that like, if you look at the Bryce Young versus C.J. Stroud, you had these evaluators being like, C.J. Stroud throws the ball better, but Bryce Young has these intangibles. And it's almost like, do you want to raise your risk profile? Because something I think you believe, which I believe too, is for a long time, the development of quarterbacks and who is going to be good was dictated by what happens before they get to the NFL. Mm-hmm. Now I think what's more important to a quarterback's success is their development once they're in the league. Mm. So what you're looking for has to change if that's the case. I was going to say, that there's, there's one other ingredient that I want to throw in here. Uh, sometimes when I'm procrastinating on work, I go to uh, profootballreference.com and just play around with statistics. And I found this, and I wonder what you think of it, because I do think that it's very germane to our conversation. Yards per completion mm-hmm. or yards per reception mm-hmm. are at an all-time low. Passes are getting much shorter. And at the same time, completion rates are getting higher. The six years in NFL history when average completion percentage was over 63% were the last six years. In 2003, the number of quarterbacks in the NFL with a completion percentage over 65% was two. Last year, it was 16. At the same time, the workhorse running back position has died out. In 2003, there were 12 running backs with 20 attempts per game. Last year, there were zero. And NFL offenses have changed a lot in the last 20 years. The workhorse running back is gone, and the new workhorse is the quarterback himself. Mm -hmm. Often he's relied on to run. Often he's relied on to sort of break play in case Mm -hmm. someone breaks through the line. And the passing game is not reliant on maybe the sort of 2006-era Peyton Manning 15-yard passes. It's a lot of six, seven, eight-yard passes with an extremely high expectation of completion. What we expect of a quarterback has changed so much. It's just, it's about like very quickly reading defenses and making really, really simple passes with really exquisite timing. And I wonder if that changes the calculus here too, because if if, if college is going to be a bunch of really creative offensive minds, and in the NFL, it's going to be much more sophisticated defenses that you have to just pick apart and go first down, first down, first down as you you know matriculate the ball down the field. I think that also changes what you're looking for in in a quarterback as well, doesn't it? I mean, I think the reason why they were more had a higher hit rate for quarterbacks in the 90s and 80s is because of what you're saying there is the workhorse running back. The offense was different. Mm. Like quarterbacks, the expectation for the quarterback was to – Attack a single high defense, which is what you are likely going to see, deeper down the field. We need you to have a strong arm and be accurate. You're not going to have to really read the defense because the strength of our offense, and we see that data um, supported through like the history of MVPs, like the strength of our offense is running the ball. Hmm. And then we see because there are like – bigger talent disparities in college, we see offensive evolution. You don't have the offensive linemen. That's really what it boils down to. Hmm. You can find athletes, like six-foot guys who weigh 200 pounds who are really quick and really fast and can catch. Like it's, They're not everywhere, but they're a lot more than six-five guys who are 330 and can move their feet. Hmm. So like you go from school to school, they have to find ways to compete when they're outmatched and they develop offensive evolutions mm-hmm. that allow them to compete. And then we in the NFL see it and like, all right, we'll take this offensive evolution and implement it because it works. But I don't think that they recognize what they need is different. Hmm. And what they need is, I think, more difficult to find. Mm. And that is, I think, goes back to the original point is like, stop trying to find the impossible thing Mm. and find, put together the most perfect machine that you can. And then the driver of it, you put him in there and don't let him mess up. And eventually he's going to have to take, like, it's inevitable. He's going to have to at some point, and you'll find out eventually, is he that guy? Is he special? I feel like this is the, I, I get into these, ridiculous Dak Prescott arguments on first take all the time but like Dak Prescott kind of exists at that line Mm -hmm. he's like at the very top end of that line where we're like are we sure he Mm -hmm. can actually do that special thing and so when people say no the question is 
would you rather be one of these other teams mm-hmm. with their other quarterback? And so that, to me, is... And the answer is maybe. And no, I don't think it is. But go ahead. Well, how is it? I don't think it's maybe. Because would you rather be searching for the thing that can push you over the line or be stuck sort of knowing you're not there? The thing that can push you over the line doesn't exist is the point that I've been trying to make the whole time. Is like No, but there are the few people in each okay. generation. Yeah. yeah. So you're going to live and die 80 years and never... But there's that's, a few people in each generation. I was going to say, yeah. I, I think, Dominic, I think... I think anybody or most people in a front office listening to this conversation are going to say, you know what? I understand the point you're making. I understand the vast, num- the vast majority of quarterbacks, even in the NFL, are basically in this B minus C plus lump. And therefore, the best strategy for them is not find the person, then build the car around them. It's build the car and then hire the driver. Like That's the yeah. strategy you're putting out. But they're still going to tell themselves, who wins Super Bowls? Right. Patrick Mahomes wins Super Bowls. Tom Brady wins Super Bowls. Peyton Manning, I guess, won one and yeah. his defense won another. <laughs> we don't give him credit <laughs> but, for that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure not trying, going to try. But they're going to tell themselves right. those special flowers exist yeah. and I'm going to find them. They're still going to lie to themselves and, and tell themselves that because they have to justify their jobs and their jobs aren't going to be preserved by saying, look, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that good at my job. I'm not that good at finding the next, next Patrick Mahomes. I can't do it. So we just have to rely on the fact that I'm going to find a B minus quarterback and we have to build a car around. As, as long as they agree to be honest and say that they're lying and I don't think it's them saying that they're not that good at their job because that is how you find the next Patrick Mahomes. Like nothing that has been said so far has like even the hypotheticals don't undercut the point that I'm making. Mm -hmm. Like I'm still saying that you need this situation in order for Patrick Mahomes to become Patrick Mahomes. And I think you're right. I think that they don't know. You don't know if you, if that guy has that until we are in those moments. Yeah. You're saying Patrick Mahomes wasn't discovered in college. He was created on the Kansas city chiefs. In part. Yes. And so the question I'm asking is if Let's say, and Patrick Mahomes wasn't the number one overall pick. So, like, stop acting like we know what we're doing here. If the only time, it's like John Elway, uh, Peyton Manning, Trevor Lawrence, Andrew Luck. Well, that's what's so exciting about Caleb because he seems like a modern version. Yeah, Caleb Williams is fine. This is in all the history of football. Mm -hmm. These are the only times where we were like, this is a can't-miss prospect, and then they actually came in. So let's stop pretending and understand. There's some interesting things. Like, one on the Mahomes piece, he was drafted in the Mitch Trubisky draft, where Trubisky, I think, was the second pick. There's (laughs) pretty objective data that – a first overall pick quarterback com- compared to the first quarterback taken when they're not the first overall pick has a higher chance of success right. because it's just the position so valuable that if there's not a guy taken first overall they don't that evaluators don't think any anything's anyone's good. Mahomes, his quotes about his mindset in college that yeah. he had to raise his risk profile and throw more interceptions because he knew his defense was going to uh, allow seventy points a game or sixty points a game or whatever that Texas Tech team did probably is the reason why he was underdrafted despite his traits. And the other thing about it, with Mahomes in particular, about your situation thing, we actually sort of saw the counterexample the last two years. They stripped away everything that made the situation great, and he was still great enough to lead, to, to yes. raise everything okay. up. And that happened with... I don't understand why you can't understand. No, no, no. I'm just saying it. Like, it works on both sides. Like, that's why you try and hit the home run. You find the guy uniquely talented because... Okay. When the situation isn't perfect, which it's never going to be in the NFL because everyone gets hurt, he was you have the, someone who's a floor okay. raiser and a ceiling I get your raiser. point. He was the 10th pick onto a team that was 13-3. and three. So no, that, totally, that's, not the, totally. example, that's yeah. not the example that I'm arguing against. Yeah. Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs fit my example. Yeah. And him having success now is just an, another example of Tom Brady. It's exactly what my point is, is you get a guy into a situation that is good and you allow him. It's the opposite of David Carr. It's don't ruin him early. (laughs) Allow him to develop. Don't get him sacked 300 times. Allow him to develop into the best version of himself. Uh, Quarterbacks are hothouse flowers. Get them in there and protect them and let them become the players that you want them that the best versions of themselves by building a system that works for them. And then every off season, like a basketball player, they can add something else to their game because they're not running for their lives. Like you're not going to convince me that Ben Roethlisberger was some like 
<laughs> awesome special quarterback. Bill Roethlisberger came and beat me my rookie year in Denver in an AFC championship game. I was there. He was giving me work, not because he was great, because that team was really good and he got into a good situation. Eli uh, Eli Manning and the Giants, not as good. He wasn't as great. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phillip Rivers in uh, San Diego, they had a lot of talent. Like, this is – over and over again, the same thing is happening. But because we are so obsessed with quarterbacks, we convince ourselves that it's because the quarterbacks are special and not because the situations are special that allow the quarterbacks to become special. I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I agree with the, the idea that great systems are more responsible for producing great quarterbacks than great scouting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, the great system just matters more than the quality of the scouting. And I think that sometimes we lie to ourselves because we think, oh, because scouting yeah. the next Patrick Mahomes is important, and it is, right. it, if that formula existed, it would co- people would pay a trillion dollars for it. But we lie to ourselves because we say, because it's important to find the next Patrick Mahomes, it's possible. Yeah. Right? Yes. It's so important that it, it, it has to be possible. My very job depends yeah. on it being possible. And it's like, no, you have to be much more humble about the ability to predict taking what you said, an orchid out of one environment and trying to plant it in another where it might not grow or it might grow much better. The system matters more than, than the scouting. I, 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 I agree with that. If you go grab an orchid and you want to make it grow in Oklahoma, then you got to have some, some nice sun lamps. You got to have a nice irrigation system for year one. Maybe you can take one away for year two. Maybe you can take the other one away for year three. Maybe by year four, that thing is blooming all on its own. And you can make other shortcuts I elsewhere. Honest, I don't know the first thing about orchids. Yeah, I, don't I don't know either. why I made a flower I, metaphor. I like it. That it was, was very persuasive. Yeah, it yeah. was good. So, Charlie's so mad. No, no, no. So right. No, before <laughs> we move on, I still think traits matter. I still think the talent. Okay. Yeah. But my, my, I do have one other question. Not this is traits don't matter. Well, this is something that's really interesting now because we've now seen it with Jordan Love. We saw it with Rodgers. We saw it with Mahomes. There is something that is in conflict here. The value of the rookie contract and the fact that the most important thing is to develop your quarterback. Do you think it's sort of wrong how people are handling this? Would it be better yes. if the only real important thing in the rookie contract is to develop someone who can be a franchise quarterback? Are we doing this wrong? Are we actually valuing the rookie contract in the wrong way? Absolutely. I think this is not any different than um, baseball figuring out money ball and basketball figuring out the three-point shot. I think this is the same thing happening in football. I can't wait for 10 years from now when everyone can come back to this podcast and say, see, Dominique told you that you guys were focused on the wrong thing. I think it seems pretty obvious to me based on the examples that we have out here. And because football, as we started with this, is about the complexity of football and how difficult it makes to predict certain things, I think it's easy to obscure what's important. And that position is so important that we want to say that that person is the special thing when actually I think protecting the special thing is the important thing. Nurturing the special thing, nature versus nurture, I just figured that out too. We got it all solved. You can end your podcast, end your column. All your big questions have been figured out by me today in my quarterback conversation. It's just fascinating because this is there used to be a huge correlation between college starts and NFL success, and we're now, like, if this is true, we're going to And that's broken down? Yeah, that, that used up until about 10 years ago. You could draw a line between the guys who had started three or four years of college football and who had successful NFL careers. I think that's going to change vastly as the situation continues to matter more and more, and they're more interchangeable quarterbacks. I love it. Got my first win of the day. What's next, Charlie? Should we, should we pivot to – so we're going to pivot to baseball. And for, we're going to talk a little Tommy John, but first, I do think we should talk about the Shohei Otani story. This is a story okay. that I know has fascinated all three of us. Um, our opinions on it have probably changed drastically – from the initial news dump that, oh my God, Shohei and his interpreter were four and a half million dollars in gambling debt, to the recent um, DOJ uh, report that it's actually forty point seven million dollars in debt, mm-hmm. and Ipe Shohei's um, manager and translator might have been the worst gambler of all time, <laughs> but the best con man of all time, where he had taken. Shohei's bank account over, had gotten all of the alerts sent to his phone, was impersonating Shohei Otani to his bookie. And I don't really have a huge question about this, but what do you guys think is most interesting about what has gone on with Shohei Otani and his uh, interpreter over the last two weeks? When the Shohei Otani news broke, I was so ready to put my tinfoil hat on. I was sure that Otani Mm -hmm. was in on it. It just didn't make any sense 
that an ordinary person making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year could get four, ten, turned down one hundred eighty million dollars in debt, or at least have you know a credit for one hundred eighty yeah. million dollars with the bookie. It made no sense. Right. Obviously, Shohei Otani knew about this. He was betting. I was so ready to believe that. I do think that the DOJ report that came out pretty conclusively proves that this translator absolutely ran Shohei's life right. and managed to, you know, uh, Bill Simmons compared it to sort of like a talented Mr. Ripley mm -hmm. situation of being able to impersonate Shohei Otani. In a way, much more sadly, it reminded me of almost like, uh, like a conservatorship, like someone pretending to be an infirmed older person and yeah. like lying to their family about what's going on. I mean, I was thinking there is no way that Shohei Otani like knew, didn't know about this. The guy would have had to literally imp this, his translator would have had to literally impersonate him to both the bank and his financial advisor. Yeah. That's the only thing that could possibly explain this. And the DOJ report comes out and it's like, no, Mizuhara literally impersonated Otani to both the bank and the financial <laughs> advisor. And the craziest thing to me, like the, at this point, Obviously, it's an absurd yeah. heist. You know, right. being upset at Ipe is 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 obvious. There's no yeah. point in talking about that. The party that I am most stunned by is CAA, yes, the agency, right. because CAA, when they got Otani as a client, said they were going to surround him with managers and with financial advisors. It turns out, and this is mostly from Wall Street Journal reporting, they did not talk to Shohei Otani at all. Mm -hmm. They had no one on their baseball team that even spoke Japanese. Yeah. So the only point of contact was this interpreter. And it's amazing to think that they could be like sitting in a room being like, hey, by the way, there's some in, you know discrepancies that have showed up in your uh, checking account yeah. where the Los Angeles Angels are depositing all of your checks, anything going on there. And Shohei Otani is just like looking at the wall while his interpreter is saying, oh, yeah, yeah. no, Shohei Otani actually wants that to be totally private. He has a bunch of things that he's, you know, buying there. It mostly involves some offshore stuff. But I, I assure you it's yeah. it's it's all legal. Like, please don't look into it very closely with the DOJ or any kind of financial advisor. I mean, it's just absurd and embarrassing for yeah. any agency to have a $700 million man and not have any ability to talk to him, which appears to be the case. They want it to be easy. Anything that would have been difficult, it's like, oh, we got a guy, speaks great English, he can handle all this, we don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Like, it seems pretty obvious to me how you could end up there. You're right, someone else should have done something in this process. But I want to push back on something that Charlie said off the top, is that Ipe was like a, a great con man. It seems like a terrible con man. He just <laughs> he happened to come that, up against he did some text really... Them. Yeah, he, he just came up with some really terrible con defense mm -hmm. because a good con man would have just stole $140 million, which is what he could have done, and no one would have caught him. A good con man would have not texted <laughs> to his bookie, you know what? I did it. I stole that money. Like, he just <laughs> seems like just two guys, and I, I don't, I'm trying to find a way to say this that's not disparaging to Shohei, but I'll just say that... <laughs> He had a lot to worry about, so maybe, or a lot of other things to focus on, so maybe it's understandable how he could end up in this situation. That's what I did. I texted a, a few people who work in baseball, and one of the overriding things was that Shohei was, and this is a direct quote, too pure, like which made him like uniquely susceptible to this type of thing and trusting of someone like Ipe. This, this, I think, this, I think, is a plausible story. I, I have no idea if this is true, but something like this is a plausible story. So the account that Mizuhara was stealing the money from was yep. the account that the Los Angeles Angels were depositing uh, Otani's checks into. Yes, all the endorsements and all the money that Otani was making outside of his which was ninety salary, million dollars a year. Yeah, it was ninety million dollars a year. You're from saying his all the Japanese outside. endorsements for the last several years while he was making less from the Angels. And how much he was making from the Angels? I think I can't remember what it was what it was for arbitration, but something 30, 30, I think it was net fifty million dollars over that right. first contract pre this seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Okay, and then you add you, you and right, and then you add sort of California taxes, yeah. which I'm sure he's paying in the highest bracket. They're probably going to take fifty two percent or so. So you're making half of that. So he's got this account right that he's making getting money from the Angels. His other account is the big one. Right. It's one with ninety million dollars. How crazy would it be? If Shohei Otani told his best friend, maybe one of his only friends in the world, his his translator, who is his manager, his everything, he says, you know what? Use this account to do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. I trust you. Right. You're my boy. Yeah. 
you you want to go to Vegas and like do something like you yeah. want to stay in like a suite, you can use this account. I'm not even going to look. The other account is the one with 90 million dollars coming into it every single year. And then I'm not actually interested in because it is sensitive to new successes that I have in the marketplace. Right. right. Oh, I get like a new I have a new endorsement from, you know, the Japanese right. bank. OK, cool. That's fine. I'm going to pay attention to that. You know, Ipe, do whatever you want to do with this account. I'm not paying attention. Ipe then goes to a bookie and says, hey, guess what? I know that you've seen my whatever tax returns and I only make $500,000 a year, but but the most famous baseball player in the world has told me that I have infinite access to the checking account that is hooked up to the LA Angels. So let me go $40 million into debt with you. I'll just keep transferring money. I think that's how it started. Yeah. But I guess to your point, yes, it's a, it's a brilliant con from the start. But the key to being a brilliant con artist is not getting caught. And the key yeah. to not getting caught is not getting $40 million in debt to an illegal bookie. So it, it, it might have started with brilliant con artistry, but it did not end with brilliant con artistry. Betting on UCLA women's soccer. <laughs> 19,000 bets, 17 That's bets That's when day. you know you're down bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's when it's $300,000 on the plus one of UCLA women's soccer. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I, I would understand that. I mean, it seems like it'd be a great way to, honestly, like, it's like being married in some regard. It's like, my wife and I both have access to accounts. I'm not checking day to day. Mm -hmm. She stays home. So mm -hmm. yeah, some of the bills, I need to take care of these. Some of the things by plan vacations, cool. I'm not out here like checking every day. What's this? What's that? And like for show, hey, that would be a situation that makes sense. I need to focus on baseball. You handle all this, this account. Don't do me too dirty, but like you can go have a good time, have fancy dinners. We rich, baby. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. But this fool went and ruined that by trying to win big He just didn't have enough excitement in his life. He really almost ruined it. We have text messages that show that there was a bookie watching Shohei Otani walk his dog. Yeah. He was. It seems like he was like minutes away from a very bad situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Anything else you want to hit, Charles? Yeah, let's quickly talk about something that's like also plaguing baseball, which is also plaguing Shohei Otani, which is pitcher's elbows, which is... Guys are throwing harder, mm -hmm. and they're spinning the ball more because they're throwing harder. More velocity, more control, more Tommy John, more rotator cuff surgeries. And you're looking at a game where we might be careening towards the extinction of the number one pitcher. Guys are throwing fewer innings, throwing harder. And Shane Bieber's recently gotten hurt. Spencer Strider's recently gotten hurt. Garrett Cole's recently gotten hurt. Something like half of the hardest throwing pitchers in the major leagues are going under the knife for Tommy John surgery. And there's a question here of how big of a problem is this for Major League Baseball? And do we think it is something that is correctable if the game is still going to have a pitch clock, is still going to function the way that it currently does? So I think that most people right now want to blame the pitch clock mm -hmm. because that's the most recent change. And when you see a recent phenomenon, like a lot of players' elbows are blowing up, you blame the most recent thing to have changed. I think it goes much deeper. I'm very interested in a phenomenon that I've called the dark side of Moneyball. Mm -hmm. I think baseball, more than any other sport, but this is certainly a phenomenon that is happening across sports, almost solved itself. Yeah. The smart guys mm -hmm. figured out, oh, here's what we need to do to the launch angle. Here's what we need to do to walks. Here are the stats that matter most. Here's what we should do for pitchers. We should have more pitchers pitch fewer innings, throw harder with more movement. Mm -hmm. That's good strategy. Like in a vacuum, it was a bunch of smart decisions. But as I wrote in this piece for The Atlantic, sometimes you can win the finite game right. and lose the infinite game. You can get really, really good at winning the day-to-day -day game, but you can ruin aspects of the larger sport. And I think that one thing that's happened to baseball more generally is that, number one, I think it's gotten more boring it's be yeah. as it's become a solved sport. There have been fewer hits, fewer base runners, fewer stolen bases, and more true outcomes of just walks, strikeouts, and home runs. I think that's led to a more boring game. It also, before the pitch clock, led to, I think, a longer game. But the other thing that ha that's happened is two baseball players' bodies. Yeah. I think that the way that baseball teams have figured out is optimal for for players to pitch is so far from optimal from the way that human arms should move ever right. that it has increased the incentive on the front end for people to just throw their arm out. Yeah. And then, I think I might be uh, getting ahead on a point that you want to make, but there's also an incentive on the back end. Yeah. We're getting much better at fixing people that throw out their arm. Tommy John surgery is much better than it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. There's even some results from Tommy John surgery where you can make the arm tighter, where players are throwing even faster, whatever it is, nine months 
after their surgery. Yeah. And so as long as baseball teams are going to keep handing out, you know, 50, 100, 150 million dollar salaries, these players that are throwing their arms out, they're going to keep throwing their arms out as fans at home think, wait, where's my favorite pitcher? Where's Strider? Yeah. Where, are, where are all these guys? It's just a part of what I see as the dark side of Moneyball. Yeah, I, I think this is, uh, is, we're either going full circle or I'm just exposing that I can only see the world one way. And that I think this is the same reason why we have a hard time predicting quarterbacks. Is I think that baseball and basketball to some degree are on a far end of the complexity spectrum from football. Hmm. Football is a not complicated game, but it's a very complex game, meaning there are a bunch of different variables. Essentially, there are a bunch of different games happening on the field at the same time. What's happening on the offensive line has absolutely no correlation to what the receivers and corners are doing. Same thing with the quarterback, linebackers, running backs, the coaches. Like, the complexity of the game makes it so that you can't solve it. Hmm. And I think that makes it so the game can survive analytics. Hmm. Baseball's simple as hell. Yeah. Basketball's pretty simple, too, but we're talking about baseball. Basketball's done a better job, but they've also suffered. I mean, I think there is some diversity in play in basketball more now than, but still, yeah. we still know that there's a lot more three-pointers. But we'll do the two sports that we're talking about that are on the farthest end of the spectrum. Baseball's so simple. There is a right way to play if you want to win. Every play. Once yeah. the ball's in play, there's a right play every single time the ball leaves the pitcher's hand. Right. And also in a world where there's more true outcomes of mm -hmm. just strikeouts, right. walks, home runs, those other eight guys in the field might as well not be there. Yeah. You might as well be watching a kind of fencing, yeah. right? It's 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 a duel. It's a duel of pitcher and catcher versus batter. You know, if you're just going to have those true outcomes of walk, strikeout, and home run. So it's it's not that that duel isn't complicated and compelling. It is complicated mm -hmm. and it can be compelling. But I, I'm with you. It's it's easier to solve for a duel mm -hmm. than it is to solve for however many permutations and combinations you get when you have 11 guys lining up against 11 guys. And a lot of them can do whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> once and the and their, their jobs are different. Like I can walk to next to a number of different football players. Like I stand next to Ray Lewis, and you're like, oh, you guys do the same thing? That was and one of the craziest he, things. He's not even the the most different from me. Like, Jonathan Ogden is like, oh, you guys are in the same, <laughs> like, league? And then there's a, a white guy who's 6'5 and kind of slim. Like, oh, yeah, he does the same thing, too. It's like, it's so weird. Then there's a guy kicking it. Right. Like, what is he <laughs> doing here? And so, like, I think that makes it difficult, and that complexity is what makes it kind of endlessly interesting, which is why you can have different schemes offensively and different schemes defensively that are all kind of optimizing in your way. And the other thing about foot or about baseball, the way to optimize baseball also leads to fewer stars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, very which, important. Like, point. Yep. The point that you were making before where we I would want to tune in to see the one guy who's about to break this record or the one guy that I know is good as hell. Like, I want to watch Shohei. I tune, I don't tune into a bunch of baseball. Charlie's trying to sell me that they fixed the game with the it's pitch. It's a lot clock. better on TV. I will now. Mm -hmm. But last year, I tuned in, you know what, to see Shohei because mm -hmm. it's one guy doing something special. I would not tune in to a team that had one guy that could pitch like Shohei and another guy who could hit like Shohei. If this one dude, though, that's cool. And the way that the game, the optimization of this game is taking a whole position and quite possibly the most interesting position. Like, that was the position that we grew up. Like, there's people who hit home runs, and then there's the ace. Hmm. That's who you care about. And they are just killing it. Like, I don't, I don't know who to tune in when uh, we, like, laugh sometimes at Thursday night games when they put up the promo of the next Thursday night game. You know when it's no good quarterbacks is we get the – C.J. Watt game, you know, and they put up somebody. And that's the same thing for baseball where it's like, who are you putting up in these marquees that's going to make us tune in? Because to your infinite and finite point, slightly different, but it's about having two different goals in the game. And one of the goals is for the teams to win and be as successful as possible. The other goal is to make a compelling entertainment yeah. product. Mm -hmm. And you know what's compelling entertainment? Stars, names we know with history. And, like, coming off of watching Caitlin Clark and the women's basketball, like, if that's not a reminder to everyone else that you need to understand what's important to compel your game. Basketball and baseball, I think you need stars. Football, yeah. 
you need quarterbacks, but football, frankly, it seems like the complexity itself and its connection to American culture will make it, and the violence will make it so it's fine. So unless you guys going to start adding some violence, uh, you need to understand how to marry the entertainment value of your game with the incentives that you're creating on the other side. Yeah. And this is also like the culture of baseball is kind of rigid. Mm-hmm. And that's like it makes it very difficult, yeah. I think, to because like this this rule change is largely overdue. Like the pitch clock is an yeah. overdue rule change. They're just getting around to it and they need to at some point get on the same page and understand that we are falling behind as far as entertainment is concerned. So there's a lot of stuff there that's really interesting. And I think like the creation of stars in baseball, yeah, there are fewer twenty game winners. I don't know if there will ever be another three hundred game winner, which is like a bummer because chasing records in baseball seemed to mean more than did in other sports. So it was just more one to one comparing eras because stats, the games, they all lined up. Um, but we are still seeing that having a dominant starting pitcher can be the most important thing in October to win World Series. Like some of the notable World Series you remember or postseason you remember are Strasburg winning five starts. Mm-hmm. Sadly, he then threw 535 more pitches in his career because his elbow and shoulder blew out. Mass and Bumgarner had dominant postseason performances, but was sadly out of uh, being an effective pitcher when he's 26 years old. Mm. So, like, it really goes back and forth. And I don't know how relevant this is to the entertainment product, but one of the things I think is really interesting is the optimization of performance in baseball. It used to be the most rare thing to have an electric arm, to have someone who could throw almost 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. That was, like, the holy grail, finding those guys. They had Bob Feller in the 40s throwing next to a car driving 100 miles an hour because they thought it was so unbelievable that someone could throw a baseball that hard. Now, they can they have it down to a science. You have someone with an elastic arm who can throw in the upper 80s, low 90s, they can get you to 100 miles an hour. And that's like, I don't know if that's... Because these guys are obviously sick. There are just more sick pitchers now than like... It's not really affecting the quality of the game that Shane Bieber's out. There's another guy who's going through 100 miles an hour and the ball sinks and moves and befuddles hitters. But... To me, it's just insane that we've gotten to a point where you have made the most rare skill the most common. Hmm. And that the the rarity is also what makes it special. Yeah, I didn't really have a point there. No, no, no. It's weird. 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 Before, excuse me, before um, uh, Derek Jeter is my favorite baseball player, Nolan Ryan is my favorite baseball player. And I believe that at one point in the 1970s, 1980s, he had the fastest pitch in Major League history. And he's he's a fascinating guy because he's someone who really did just throw 100, 100, 100, 100. And he played until he was like 47 years old. Like, yeah. We need to study that man's arm. We need to yeah. take like whatever gene was is like built his shoulder blade and find some way to like splice it into a generation. Like there's something that Nolan Ryan was doing that would the, really be valuable for today's pitchers. <laughs> the thing that I find interesting about what you said, Charlie, is like you didn't have a question, but you didn't need to. We can have a conversation. I think the part that I find interesting is you would think that that would be something that players would not appreciate in the long run because it makes their bodies more disposable it's like we're going to like tweak your arm angle and your pitching technique and everything and training in order to make injury a almost certainty but make you throw really hard but also everyone else throws really hard but you can't differentiate yourself but I actually think that it's probably one of few times and I think about running backs in football where hmm disposability is actually in the player's benefit Hmm. in a way that in football it's not. So in baseball, the disposal, or excuse me, in football, obviously we see the disposability running backs. They just cycle them through. But in, in baseball, they're doing a similar thing with pitchers, Hmm. but they're keeping the pictures Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they're ending up having longer careers. And I think that what would happen otherwise is there'd be the one Nolan Ryan who was special. He'd get, a ridiculous contract, and then they would running back the rest of these guys. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're torn, you're gone. You're torn, you're gone. So the development, the ability to make them pitch harder in the progress and the effectiveness of the surgery, I think has ended up helping the players more than you would think, which is normally like as a players union guy, when the league gets excited about something or coaches have a new technique, it never is in our favor. But this one kind of feels like for the pitchers that do have success – they probably most of them end up having longer, better careers. And some of them who were throwing 80 and had movement get to the major leagues 
now and they never would have in the past. Yeah, it makes me want to do a feature that's like the endangered species of sports, right? Yeah. Like the workhorse running back, endangered species. Like the starting pitcher who wins 20 games a year, another endangered species. Certainly the pitcher that wins 300 games in his career is yeah. endangered species. I mean, I remember looking at someone like DeGrom, like maybe the most talented pitcher in, in yeah. baseball, you know, on like a per throw basis. He's won like 60, maybe you can look this up as I'm talking. He's won like 60 games in his career There was a or something. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just fascinating how our expectation of starting pitcher greatness has been totally warped in this new age of the arm and the science of the arm and our ability to turn many different people into uh, human beings that can throw a Nolan Ryan pitch briefly before they flame out. I... I'm not the writer you are, but I do know that we need three. We can't just do, we got to find. Rules of three, absolutely. I mean, I feel like what's after endangered because the post move big man in basketball, he long been dead. I mean, Zach Eady is the only one left. I mean, that, or, that's that's got to be it. And Eady is such a great <laughs> news peg. You start with Eady and then you say he's your first example. Right. It's the it's it's the Eady style center. And then you go into the other two. I th that's the piece. It's, yeah. already, it's already done. There was, um, it just reminded me of something else. I, I, I think we probably are running out of time pretty soon. But this just kind of segue into another topic that I thought was interesting that connects like the endangered species with also the entertainment value is kind of how professionalized youth sports has gotten. Mm -hmm. And it makes players less interesting. I was thinking about the endangered species in basketball was like, and I, I've had this conversation with Bomani Jones a couple of times. He reminds us that basketball was better when we had less good basketball players because there were guys who, whose job was to be an enforcer. And his job was to get rebounds. And those are guys who had personality. Yeah. There's a lot more personality. And I've come to believe, this is my own personal theory, is that once they find out you're good, they start putting you in these professional programs for just about every sport hmm. immediately. Hmm. And they start training you on how to be a pro. Maybe you don't make it, but the ones who make it are already so good at everything and already had the quirkiness. Like, I remember Bill Cartwright's jump shot. <laughs> that would never make it to the NBA now. And I loved laughing at Bill Cartwright's jump shot with my friends. Yeah. Like, all that stuff is gone. And I think we assume that better is always more interesting. But better is not always better mm -hmm. in entertainment. And that's like, uh, I, this is, you are ahead of your time because this goes back to the piece you wrote, wrote a few years ago and that we see the same thing in like movies and entertainment. It's like they've optimized for what's going to make the most money. And they're not willing to take some shots and throw some duds out there again and sometimes hit a home run and open up something that we didn't know we were interested in. Well, people root for weirdness. Yeah. We root for what we've never seen before. And one reason why the Caitlin Clark phenomenon was so captivating, I think, for so many people is that watching someone just pull up at the logo and yeah. hit three yeah. after three is just it's just shocking to see in college sports. And then you add to that the fact that she's actually an exceptional outlet passer. Yeah. Like she's yeah. an unbelievably exciting passer. And so again, the Caitlin Clark phenomenon is not something you would ever teach necessarily, although unfortunately it's now going to be taught because oh, yeah. she's so successful. It rather surprised us by its weirdness. Like what we want to be shocked by, I think, when we watch sports is not just to see the same thing we saw yesterday and the day before and the day before. We want to see something that we've never seen before. And that gets harder when we develop these sort of professional pipelines that are really, really good at minting the same athlete over and over again. And it's, it's not, I think this is, and someone's going to have to end this because I'm not going to stop talking because it's too much fun and too interesting. But I think the Caitlin Clark story is a great one for now to mirror a bunch of different things that we've already talked about, especially in the entertainment value of this. Because I do believe that, there is art and then someone figures out that art can be profitable and then you find a way to make it more and more profitable and then you keep going and it's sweet it's fine it means more money it means more attention it means more fun then there's a certain point where you cross that threshold into now this is about making money and things stop being as fun and i think that women's college basketball is at that sweet spot where men's college basketball mm. was when i was a kid because all the things that we're talking about of diversity of play. I watched LSU throw the ball in the post and ask Angel Reese to do those mediocre post moves to win. <laughs> it was very different than the way that Caitlin Clark was playing. And we talk about personalities. We see, again, Angel Reese 
ton of personality. Don Staley, very different personality. Caitlin Clark mm -hmm. telling everybody, you can't see me. Mm -hmm. Different personality. The same thing with um, Kim Mulkey, ton of personality. And it feels like they're at that point where it's just a sweet spot. And, it's a, and we talked about like stars being around long enough in baseball that you can fall in love with them or learn to hate them and it makes you care. Mm -hmm. They're doing the same thing in women's college basketball. So we are at that sweet spot. And I don't know what we did to cross the threshold for so many of our other sports, but please, let's not do it for them and try to turn back the clock on the rest of them. Amen to that. Yeah. There's, there's the dismount. By the way, Jacob deGrom went 10-9 and nine with a 1.7 ERA. Wait, wait, no, what, what's, his career, what's his career number of wins? He has won 84 career games. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. <laughs> All right, this has been great. I loved it. Thank you so much, Derek Thompson, for joining us. I hope that um, you can find time to do this with us again sometimes, and we're more than happy to join you if you do a sports topic. Don't bring us on to talk about COVID or an election or religion or any other important things that you talk about. I would love, I'd, I'd love to have you on the show. Be beginning of football season, I want to talk about seeing... I'm really interested in getting smarter about watching football. Like when I watch football at home, sometimes I wonder with, with, with my friend that I watch with, what should I be looking at? When I was younger, I used to always look at the quarterback. And right. now I'm trying to look more at the line, look more at the defense. I would love to do a show that's like how to watch football like a pro. And I feel like maybe I should go to a pro for that. So okay. I can't wait. That. I'd love to do that with you. I'll tell you as soon as this is we start recording okay. all the secrets. And then everyone else can tune in your podcast to hear it. All right. Seriously, genuinely, thank you so much. This has been better than I even expected. I hope you enjoyed yourself. We can have you back. Um, thank you, Charlie. Doing a great job as usual. Thank you, Podville, this beautiful studio, and all my great producers. Thank you, Megan, Serafina, Brian, and Kevin. Not Cortez. We're out. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.